you know, as we're here today, um, and just thinking about lots of things we could share with you, I just, what I had on my heart was to talk for a few moments about this, that God has called each of us to live as spirit beings, not as mere men. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 3, we see this, that Paul writing here to these people, he said, they, you are still carnal. Now, the Corinthian church had lots of manifestations of the Spirit, but the people lived pretty carnal lives. They didn't walk in love. They kind of had competitions and jealousies. Uh, they had sin in their midst. You know, they had all kinds of things. And so he said, you are still carnal. But notice what he says, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So there is a difference between being carnal and, and what God wants us to be, or being a mere man and being what God wants us to be. God never called us to be just a mere man, just an average human being. Well, I'm just an average Christian. What's an average Christian? Actually, the average Christian is a spirit-filled Christian. A normal Christian is a spiritual Christian. Hallelujah. So you see that. Now, this is, uh, I think, the King James Version that's up there on the board. Uh, no, that is New King James. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and so uh, that's interesting. So you have, if you go down to verse 3, that's the one we want. Yeah. And so notice that it, it says here that we are behaving like mere men. Now, God does not want us to be like mere people. In other words, just like everybody else. There should be a difference between Christians and the world. We know that. But there should be a marked difference between a child of God and a worldly person. And for far too long, we have entertained the values of the world in the church. We have allowed the things of the world to creep into our life in the church. And as Christians, we've, we've dabbled with them. We've played with them. And, and we've, you know, kind of had this mixture in our life. Okay, you know, it's Sunday morning. I better put on my spiritual, you know, look and go to church. I'm spiritual. Praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful? But Monday morning, okay, I'm back out in the world and I kind of, it should not be that way. We should be one way all the time, and it's God's way, and it's not a mere man, it's a spiritual person. So God has for us as believers this great desire that we live and walk and move as spirit beings, not as mere men. So I, I thought about that, and I thought, how do we do this? Well, it starts with desire. It starts with our desire. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, hallelujah, we see here it says, uh, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, the students know this because we were just teaching on this over the weekend in Rhema. But uh, that word there where it says spiritual gifts, the word gifts in the most English Bibles uh, is an italicized word. And what that means is that it's not found in the original Greek translation. So actually, the original Greek translation, the word spiritual is actually a plural word. So it should actually have an S at the end of spiritual and then no gifts there. And so it should say concerning spirituals. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means things that have to do with the realm of the spirit. There could be gifts of the spirit. It can also be things that have to do with the Holy Spirit or any spiritual manifestation. So really what he's talking about here is all spiritual things. God does not want us to be ignorant. So then if we go over to chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, verse number 1, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. And that word desire is a word that means to be zealous for or to be passionate about. So we're to be zealous for or passionate about the things of the Spirit spiritual things. And so we're to pursue after those. That's 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number one. Now, if we understand that then, that we are, first of all, God does not want us to be ignorant about these things. So then that means he wants us to know. And he's not saying that just to a few people. So it's not just for the pastors. It's not just for church leaders. It's not just for Bible school students. It's for all believers. 
He wants us all to know and understand him to the point that we know and understand the ways of the Holy Spirit, that we have fellowship with him, that, that we work with him, that he flows through us, that we have understanding of spiritual gifts and manifestations and all of these things. Because you see, God is building up a body of of believers. He's building up people so that they can take this message that we've been given and take it to the world. Hallelujah. So we see then that we're to desire these things. Well, Psalm 37 and verse 4, very familiar scripture for us, but that word says that God will give us the desires of our heart. So if God tells us to desire something, and he says, I will give you the desires of your heart, then we have a a, a right then to expect and to believe that as I desire to know and understand spiritual things, that I will know and understand them, that he will teach me, that he will show me. And so this this starts with our desire, just stirring up our desire for it. Lord, I want this. I want to see you move. I want to see your glory. I want to see manifestations of the Spirit, not just in our church services, but when, I, when I'm out, you know, even outside the church somewhere. I, I want to see in the marketplace. I want to see you moving. And I want to see you moving in me and through me. Hallelujah. So we stir up our desire for these things. Then secondly, we are to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So this is how we move from being a mere man to being a spiritual person. We are to develop relationship with the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, it says in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, Paul just prayed a very quick prayer there for those people. And he said, I I pray that the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you. And so God wants us to have communion and fellowship with him, but in particular with the Holy Spirit. And the reason is, is because when Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. So he sent then the Holy Spirit to the earth. And the one who lives inside of you right now, if you're a child of God, is the Holy Spirit. He comes to live in you. And and so the Bible tells us that he will never leave us or forsake us. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. He's always with you. And there's so many things that he does. He leads you, he guides you, he teaches you, he shows you things to come. Uh, You know, he'll reveal the plan of God for your life. Uh, He comforts you, he helps you, he empowers you. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that he does in our life and it's wonderful. But but here God is saying, I'm praying, I, I want you to have communion or fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So then that means that we can develop a relationship with him, that, that it's, it's a real relationship, just like we would have a relationship with another person. We can have a relationship with Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And he's always with us. So uh, I, I like this, um, this one scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, but I'm going to read this to you in the Passion Translation. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, in the Passion Bible, it says, For by one spirit we were all immersed and mingled into one single body. And no matter our status, whether we are Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. I like that. We are all, each one of us, are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. So that, that, that speaks of fellowship and communion to where we're always just drinking of the Spirit. We're always spending time. And, and so I, here's what I've learned to do in my life. You know, it doesn't mean that I have to go lock myself in a room for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Can't do that. We, we all have things we have to do in this life. But as I do the things that I do in life, I'm always turning my attention towards Him. I'm always aware that he's with me and I talk to him and I listen to him and I worship the Lord out of my heart. Now, I don't, you know, necessarily walk down the street singing a song at the top of my lungs. You know, people would not understand that. So I don't do that. But just out of my heart, I can just very quietly, nobody even knows I'm doing it. 
I could just be praising him, worshiping him, fellowshipping with him. So I'm always aware that he's with me and I'm always including him in everything I do all day long. And, and I find that as I do that, he talks to me, he gives instructions to me, he shows me things to do and gives me vision and you know, all kinds of things that he does. And so it's a very simple relationship. It's not complicated. Uh, you know, it's, it's just include him in what you do throughout the day. Hallelujah. Now, with that in mind, then, you know, we're talking about how do you live as a spiritual person, not as a mere man. We have to learn how to host the presence of God in our lives. Now, I don't remember when I was here last year, if I shared this story with you or not. If I did, please just bear with me because I know there's some new people that if I did share it, you haven't heard it. But uh, during the time that we were in the U.S. during COVID, and we were, we were kind of uh, stuck there for about two and a half years or so, uh, we spent the, the first part of it, we were staying with some friends, and they have a, a beautiful house that's kind of on uh, right off of a river that, uh, that's there, and so they have like a little cove that comes in, you know, and, and so their house is kind of at the end there, and it's just a beautiful place, you know, it's, it, there's very few people around there, and it was a nice place to stay, you know, during all this lockdown from COVID, and so our friends have this dock that was there on the, on the water. And I would go down there and I would fish and I would just sit there and just, you know, enjoy, just enjoy nature, you know, just enjoy time with the Lord. And so one day I was down there and I was fishing and all of a sudden this little yellow bird came up and landed next to me. And I mean, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, this is unusual. So I just stayed very still to see what he does. And pretty soon he flew up and he landed on my arm and he just for about 15 seconds, this, and he's a beautiful little yellow bird. He just kept looking. He's looking at me. He knew I was there, but he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And I'm thinking, well, hello there. <laughs> and then he flew off. But, you know, in that little bit of time, I fell in love with that little bird. I just thought it was the most amazing thing that this creature that lives out in the forest would feel so comfortable that it would come and just land on my arm and, and be with me. And, and so, you know, I was thinking about it. The next day I went down to the dock and I thought, I wonder if he'll come back. So I sat there really quietly waiting and he didn't come back. In fact, he never, I, he never came and landed on me again, but I would see him flying around, you know, the property there. So the Lord began to talk to me about this because in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is, is compared to being a dove. Now he's not really a dove. So, you know, the Holy Spirit does not have feathers. OK, <laughs> but but he's compared to that because of some of the characteristics of a dove. You know, they're gentle, they're peaceful, they're, you know, all of that. And so the Lord began to talk to me about the Holy Spirit resting upon me. And, and I began to realize that bird that came and landed on my arm, he felt comfortable and at home to be actually on me because I wasn't busy doing a lot of things. I wasn't moving around. I was very still. The Bible says, be still and know that I am Lord. And, and then I, I realized, you know, I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have sound going on, you know, nothing. I was, it was just very peaceful, very calm. And I began to think about this. What if I could do this in my spiritual life to where I live in such a way that I'm always maintaining peace and calm in my life, no matter what's going on around me? Because, you know, some, you can't always control what's going on around you but you can control what you have within you. And so what if I could develop myself to, to become living this way that I'm always at peace, I'm always calm, no matter what's going on, I stay at peace, I stay calm, and, and I, I make a platform where the Holy Spirit feels comfortable to land on me. You know, now, now you understand this, he's, he's with me, he's with you, he lives inside of us if we're born again children of God. But you know, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit within and the Holy Spirit upon. And, and I realized something. There's something about making a way for him, just recognizing his presence in our lives and making a way for him to feel at home in us that actually increases the anointing in our life. And, and so I, I began to take conscious steps towards that direction. One of them was I had to simplify my life. Still working on doing that. But, you know, there's sometimes in our lives, there's a lot of things that we have 
busyness, activities, all these kind of things. And we're running here and we're running there. And you know what? If I was running and doing different things, that little bird would never have sat on my arm. It was when I was still and at peace and calm and not moving that he felt comfortable to come and rest on me. So I began to realize I need to simplify my life so that the, that God is, the Holy Spirit is comfortable. I want him to be comfortable. I want him to be at home. And so the Lord began to give me this phrase, hosting his presence, hosting his presence. And, and with it, he gave me this verse of scripture. And it's found over in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8. And this is where uh, the prophet at that time, who the main major prophet of that day, I guess you could say, which was Elisha, uh, was you know in the midst of his ministry. And it tells us in, in 2 Kings 4 and verse 8 that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. So she was a very gracious, kind woman. And so she, you know, in, in, in persuaded him, come in and eat, you know, and she took care of him. So it tells us then as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. So this became a regular thing where she would invite him into her house and she would, you know, she would provide food for him. So then we see this in verse nine, she said to her husband, look, this, this is a, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Now, it's very interesting because when you understand this, back in that day, the, most people did not have the Holy Spirit upon them. Now, no one had the Holy Spirit living within them. And the reason is, is because no one was born again. Jesus had not yet come. So, you know, we don't have the Holy Spirit within us until we are born again as a child of God. So back then, no one has that. And only a handful of people had the Holy Spirit upon them. And so that would be the prophet, the high priest, and the king. So this man is a prophet. He has the Holy Spirit upon him. And what this woman was doing by inviting him into her home was actually she was hosting the presence of God. This was the way in her day, the best that she could do to host the presence of God in her life and in her home. So she invited that man in. Now, of course, in our day, we have the presence of God on the inside of us as believers. But back then, they did not have that. And, and I began to look at this and I thought, it's amazing. I mean, she, they built an addition to their home. They furnished the addition. They did all of this just so this man could come in and be comfortable. And it wasn't just that the man himself they were doing that for. Really what they were doing was they were hosting the presence of God. And, and the amazing thing about it was she was doing this with no agenda. She wasn't trying to ask for anything. She wasn't, you know, believing for any particular thing. She just simply was desiring that the presence of God would be in her home. And, and not, not even thinking about her needs or any of that. And yet what came out of that was supernaturally, she was able to conceive and have a son. She wasn't able to have a baby. Now, this could be very, this is a very interesting thing because when we are hosting the presence of God in our lives, I believe something very significant happens. We are supernaturally conceiving and giving birth to things. Now, this case, it was literally, literally a, a child. But, you know, you might be 80 years old. And you're not interested in having a child. I understand. All right. So it doesn't have to be that. But there are things that we have, dreams, visions, whatever, you name it. That, that we have, that, that God wants us to give birth to in our lives. And you know, you think about this, the spirit of the Lord is a life-giving spirit. He doesn't come to bring death, he comes to bring life. Jesus said, I have come that you would have life and have life more abundantly. Hallelujah. So if that's the case then, 
God is going to give life to your dreams and your visions and your desires and the things that he wants you to do. And, and sometimes what we're lacking is we're just not mindful enough of this. We're not hosting his presence. But as you're hosting the presence of God, something starts to come in your life. You start to give birth to things. Hallelujah. And so this woman was blessed. Now, she wasn't doing it to get something from God. It's just she just wanted to be a blessing. And, but yet God honored her, and so she has this son. And then the most amazing thing, this went on for some years because the child grew. He's out in the field with his father one day, and the child just dropped over dead. You know, just died right there on the spot. And the woman grabs, you know, puts the child in the, in the, in the room where she, where she has the prophet, and she goes running to find the prophet and, and bring him. And this prophet comes in and raises the child from the dead. Isn't it interesting? In the place where, where, where she's hosting the presence of God, there's resurrection. I wonder what kinds of things in our life that maybe we've allowed to die, maybe a dream or a vision or a hope or a desire, and it's kind of died. But you know what? You host the presence of God in your life and resurrection begins to come forth. God's going to resurrect some dreams and some desires in you today. Hallelujah. Because it's not hopeless. It's not finished. It's not the end of the story. You may say, well, I failed. I fell. I did this. Well, that may be the case, but the presence of God in your life will bring life. Hallelujah. And it'll give birth to dreams and visions and desires. And if they've died, it'll give resurrection to them as well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's why we, we want one reason why we want to host the presence of God. But are we making room for him in our life? Because sometimes we have a room, but the room's cluttered because we've got lots of other stuff. You know, I'd rather do this. I'd rather do that. I'm, I'm busy with this thing. I'm busy with that. That's why I say we have to simplify our life. Because I'm starting to realize at this stage of my life, most of the things that we do in this life have no eternal value. We're not going to take it with us. We're not going to enjoy the benefits of that for all eternity. But there are some things that have eternal value. And if we're engaged in those things and the pursuit of those things, when we get over into eternity, the, those things that we're invested in on this life that have eternal value, the benefit of that will follow us into eternity and we'll have rewards that we'll enjoy for all eternity. One thing that has eternal value is the soul of a human being. Because every human being is made by God to live eternally, and they're either going to live in heaven or they're going to be in hell for all eternity. And God has created man as an eternal being like that. And so when we understand that and we're invested in doing things that are promoting uh, people coming to the Lord and things of this nature, we're investing in things of eternal value. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so it would be good for us to think about that in our lives. What am I doing right now? And maybe we need to simplify. Maybe we need to declutter some rooms so that we can make room for him in our life. Hallelujah. I don't know what those things are. You'll have to pray and talk to the Lord, but I'm sure he's probably already talking to some of you and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so just do what he tells you to do. Hallelujah. Another way that we become a spiritual being and not a mere man is just simply staying full of the Holy Spirit. Staying full of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 and verse 19 tells us, we are not to be drunk with wine, but we're to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Hallelujah. So what does that mean? Well, be being filled is actually the meaning of that. In other words, we're to continuously be filled with the Spirit. And the best way I know to explain that would be if you were to take your car and drive it into a petrol station and, you know, you fill up the tank with petrol and then you drive off, well, eventually you're going to have to come back because why? Your petrol is, you're using the petrol and your tank has to be refilled. But now be being filled like this is talking about, because that's the literal meaning of that verse, would look like this. You pull into the petrol station and instead of, uh, you know, you pump, you, 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 you pump the, the petrol into the tank, but instead of, of, of taking that, the pump out of your, your car, you leave it attached and you drive off. Now, just imagine that you could do that somehow 
and there would not be catastrophic, okay? <laughs> you know, obviously, we can't do that, so please don't try to do that. But, but, but if we could do that, and, and it would be like you, you kept it attached, and so no matter where you went, what you were doing, all around, everywhere you go, constantly petrol is flowing into your car, so your tank never gets low, your tank never is dry, you're just always being refilled constantly as you do what you do. That's the idea here of this. So when we come to God and we walk in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, we are being filled on a regular basis, or we should be. In other words, we should not be living from meeting to meeting. Okay, I went to a meeting. Oh, that was so good. I got so much. I'm really full of God. And then a week later, man, where did it all go? I'm empty. I'm dry. Pastor, would you pray for me? Pastor, help me. <laughs> and then we're waiting for the next big meeting we can go to so we can get filled back up again. And then, you know, it's like some Christians live like that. God doesn't want us to live like that. We should be full of him every day of our lives. Hallelujah. And then when we come to the meeting, we're already full. So the meeting is just all about overflow. And it's like, wow, we're on a higher level than we've ever been before. Because we didn't come into the meeting crawling on the floor with our last little bit of energy. Fill me up, Lord, help me. <laughs> we came in full. And then because we were full, we had something to give. And so we added to the meeting. So many times we come to meetings to take from the meeting, but God wants us to come to add to the meeting. And if we'll come adding to the meeting, the meeting will be at a much higher level. Hallelujah. Because what's in you, what's in me, what's in everyone is flowing out of us as a river. And what happens when that happens? All the rivers combine into a flood. Hallelujah. And we can have a great and a glorious time in the Lord just simply because everybody came full of him already. Hallelujah. But we should maintain that in our lives. Hallelujah. And that tells us right there one way we do that is through our singing and worshiping and fellowshipping with the Lord. Now, another thing that we're to do, and uh, I think I'll, I'll probably stop with this one, but we are to allow him to flow out of our lives. Jesus said this in John chapter 37 through 39, very familiar scripture. He said, if we're thirsty, come to him and drink and, and we will be satisfied. He will fill us up. Praise the Lord. I'm just paraphrasing it. But, uh, and then he said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God wants us to allow him to flow out of our lives. You know, the drinking part, we come to him and drink, the drinking is for us, but the rivers are for others. So it's never just about us. It's never just we come to drink and that's all we do. No, we come to drink, but then we want to, we want to do that so that the rivers are flowing out of us. And notice that it says rivers, not a river. Not just one river, but there are many rivers in the spirit. There's a river of healing. There's a river of worship and praise. There's a river of encouragement, uh, just river of prayer, all kinds of rivers. And God wants these rivers to flow out of our innermost being, out of our spirit. Hallelujah. That's his design for every believer. So we are to allow him to flow out of our lives. Hallelujah. So this begins with being a spiritual person, walking and living in the spirit. It begins with our desire. It begins with that. And then we go from there. We, we develop relationship with the Holy Spirit. We host his presence. We're, we're to stay full of him at all times. And then we're to allow him to flow out of our lives. Praise the Lord. He wants to flow out of us. Hallelujah. So today, Really what we desire, and, and I believe what the Lord desires, because he put the desire within us, is that you would have an encounter with him. Maybe you're, you feel a little bit dry. Okay, well, then you can get filled up. Praise the Lord. Now you know what to do so you don't get dry again. Hallelujah. Uh, maybe you need to make some adjustments and changes, you know, d uh, simplifying your life. Maybe that's something for you. Maybe it's just... Uh, you know, doing a better job of recognizing how to host his presence in your life. Maybe you just need to stir up your desire and your hunger and thirst for him more. You know, it could be all of these different things that we're talking about here. But today, I believe you're going to have an encounter with him. You've already been having one, but he has more for you. And so we, we just simply want to take some time uh, and just to pray for you 
and let the Lord touch you and minister to you and do what he wants to do. And so uh, I know, you know, Elder Thomas has said that, the, you know, talked about receiving impartations from him, uh, words from the Lord. You know, we, we have no word to give unless the Lord gives us one. So, you know, we can't just, you know, make that happen ourselves. But if the Lord gives us something, we'll certainly give it. But nonetheless, I believe, this is what I believe. Number one, you're going to receive an impartation from him. And I don't know what that impartation will be. It'll probably be different things for different people. Yeah. Number two, you're going to receive answers and directions from him today. Hallelujah. Number three, you're going to have an encounter with him in a very special way today. And then number four, any words or anything that he may want to say to you, I believe he will say to you. Now, he may do it through us as we pray for you. He may not do it that way. He may just speak to you directly in your heart. He may inspire you to look at a particular scripture and give that to you. So we just want you to have the word of the Lord for your life, whatever that may be, and however he chooses to do it. But I believe he's going to do that for you today. Hallelujah. So that's what we're believing for. That's what we're expecting. Hallelujah. So as we pray for you today, uh, that's what we're expecting to see. Praise the Lord.